Good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is Tom Racicott with Computer Shared Governance Services. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, first of three joint webinars between Computer Shared Governance Services and TMF Group focused on doing business in foreign jurisdictions, the, the global risks and entity management. Today's session, we're going to focus specifically on uh, doing business in China. You can also register for our, our other two upcoming sessions, which will focus on India and Brazil, by visiting our website at cgs.computershare.com, which is where you registered for this session here this afternoon. Uh, just a couple of logistics for you during the, during the session here. Uh, during the webinar, you can ask questions. There's a chat window in the, the lower right-hand side of your screen there. Uh, you can ask questions that will come through to us, and we'll source them either through myself or the other presenters, uh, try to answer them during the session, or we'll hold at the end, we'll have a, a Q&A session where we'll be able to respond to uh, a bunch of questions and uh, try to answer as many as we can. Okay, so for today's session, we're going to go through a, uh, a quick introduction go through some of the, uh, the overviews of some of the vehicles, some of the processes that uh, uh, companies have been going through in China, talk about some of the benefits and uh, some of the compliance concerns that, that exist, talk about how technology can play a significant role in managing and mitigating those, those risks, uh, and then, like I said, we'll open it up for some, some questions at the end. Sessions plan to go uh, about 45 minutes, so hopefully you'll be able to stay with us throughout, uh, throughout the whole session. So go ahead and introduce uh, the speakers that we have here on the call for this afternoon. Uh, my name again is Tom Racicott. I'm the head of sales for Computer Shared Governance Services. I've uh, been in the industry for about 15 years, working primarily with large Fortune 500, Fortune 250 companies, helping them implement uh, software solutions to manage their global entity management uh, and subsidiary governance processes. Uh, we also have on the line with us Suzanne Callister. Suzanne is the Regional Director of Corporate Services for the APAC region of TMF Group. Her offices are in Hong Kong, and her team spans from Mumbai to Melbourne. Uh, Suzanne is a member, a fellow with the Institute of Chartered Secretaries in Hong Kong as well as with STEP and IFA. Our other speaker for today is Elizabeth Miner. Elizabeth leads the Subsidiary Governance and Compliance Group at Thermo Fisher. Her global team manages over 700 entities worldwide. Currently they have 17 specifically in China. And she's been using our GEMS application to manage uh, that legal infrastructure for, for a few years now. So between the three of us, hopefully we're able to, uh, to share some wisdom and some ideas and some thoughts about uh, the risks and how to mitigate them in, uh, in China. So with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll start out. Suzanne has uh, a set of uh, slides to kind of walk through to kind of talk about some of the, uh, the, the current developments in China. So Suzanne, if you could uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, good morning to everyone in the US and uh, good evening to everyone in Asia. Um, it's really a pleasure to speak to you um, on this webinar about um, what is, without doubt, one of the most exciting countries in the world at the moment, China. Um, we're going to walk you through some highlights to give you some a flavor of what's actually happening, um, starting with foreign direct investment, um, which I'll use the acronym FDI. Um, China is the top FDI confidence index for the last 11 years. It, it really is booming. This foreign direct investment is really attracted by the disposable income of Chinese population and also the massive manufacturing and production capabilities of the country. Um, there's an increasing demand for consumer groups um, and goods in domestically in China. And there's a interesting urban migration happening which is being encouraged by the government, which is also attracting um, foreign direct investment. We have this domestic market that is really growing with an appetite for everything new and exciting, everything foreign and different. So it's a very exciting market for people to get into um, from overseas. 
Um, in terms of where the money is going, Eastern China receives about the bulk of the foreign direct investment at the present time with about 83%. West China is attracting about 11.5 billion US dollars, which is about up 28% year on year. Eastern China is witnessing a 7.5% increase in FDI in the last year, and Central China is increasing by 4%. So this really is um, an exciting area. If we go to the next slide, um, we can see um, the top 10 countries with the FDI confidence index. Um, China is really important for TMF. I mean, we're a global organization, but we really have spent a lot of time in the last um, seven years we've been in China developing our offices there. And now we have nine offices, um, including Hong Kong, that we, we actually do deem Hong Kong to really be part of China. Um, our main offices are in Shanghai and Beijing, and we have a Chengdu Shed Services Center for TMF, which is in the far west of China. Um, our clients were mainly looking after foreign investors, foreign direct investors into China, um, but we're starting really to get also involved with the state-owned enterprises, which is uh, really exciting. Um, as you can see from this slide, the U.S. is still the fourth largest source of FDI, um, which is um, last year $36 billion U.S. dollars, um, incredible amounts of money. Uh, Europe is the second largest source of FDI, um, and it's worth noting that China inward investment to the EU in 2011 was 3.2 billion euro. So the money is flowing both ways. Um, obviously, key to the FDI for Europe is Germany, and number one in terms of FDI is Asia. Um, so we looked at um, Asia's FDI climbing 14% to 200 billion US dollars last year. Um, 12.5 billion coming from Japan. So moving to the next slide, we're going to talk about recent investments, recent things that have happened in China. So almost 28,000 foreign companies were established in 2012. Uh, Coca-Cola now has 40 factories. It employs 48,000 people in China. Um, and it's intensifying its commitment um, with a 46 billion US dollar investment in the next three years. So, I mean, significant investors. Um, Starbucks brought coffee to China. Nobody thought the Chinese would ever drink coffee. They thought they would still stick to tea. But now, as you can see, there's 750 outlets of Starbucks throughout Greater China. So, um, the US has managed to change China into a coffee drinking um, um, country, which is great. And then also, Shanghai um, has is now the... Um, uh, has a has a Disney park which is uh, under construction. So that's the third that's the first major theme park for this this U.S. company um, in China. So this is all very exciting. Moving on to the next slide, slide seven. Um, let's talk a little bit about the industry hubs in China. Uh, China is the largest cotton producer, the largest food producer. Um, it produces more solar panels than anybody else in the world and also leads the global gold production. Um, also, in terms of output, it outputs 45% of the world's steel and 95% of the world's rare earth min um, minerals, which are really the, that set of 17 chemical elements in the periodic table. So it's quite incredible. It's also the world's biggest IPO market, and surprisingly enough, it files more patents than ever any other country. The government is really encouraging any kind of new information and agricultural technology industries coming into China and offering incentives for those types of industry. Um, the most concentrated industries that are attracting foreign direct investment are manufacturing real estate and leasing and commercial services. So these are very, these are sectors which are very active with foreign direct investment at the moment. It's a very well-trodden path. Um, moving on to just some of the interesting um, cities in China. Um, Hulan is a media hub. Um, it's actually the center of the Chinese media business, which is a six, 688 billion renminbi business. And it is the, third, the world's third largest market for entertainment. Um, and the government have actually predicted that this, this city will have a growth of 12% over the next five years, which is just incredible. 
Um, Shanghai um, is really a titan in the automotive sector. Um, Four million vehicles were sold by SAIC in 2011. By 2015, um, the government predicts that China's automotive market will exceed US, Japan, and Germany combined. This is just incredible. And it's estimated that by 2015, Chinese, communicators, uh, Chinese consumers will buy 25.5 million vehicles. Beijing is the, obviously the um, capital and the location of China's so-called Silicon Valley, with players such as Google and Twitter and Intel and Facebook and Apple um, very active in this, um, in this city. Moving to the west of China, um, we have Chengdu, which is really a nice center for software industry. Um, more than 250,000 people are actually employed in this industry here. It's a very modern, large city filled with software parks and incentives. Um, the Apple iPad is really just made just very close to Chengdu, and we have a very big office there. It's a, it's a very lovely city. Um, Shizhou um, is the site of the China Singapore Suju Industrial Park, and it's China's only nanotechnology innovation base. Uh, Chongqing is one of the largest municipalities in the world with 45 million people. Um, it has an estimated average growth of 30% per year. It's just, it just incredible. So all of these cities have really um, benefited from the government's Go West development strategy where they actually provided incentives and reasons for people to actually go west of China and um, develop businesses there. And the next slide, we talk about uh, Huindao, which is near Beijing. Um, this is the most foreign bank-intensive city in China. I mean, we have um, 42 banking institutions, 49 securities and future institutions, 45 insurance companies. You have the names like JP Morgan, the big four accounting firms, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, Bank of America are all in this city. Guangzhou and Shenzhen. These were the first areas of investment. This is really the Pearl River Delta area of China. This is where China first opened for business in 1979. Um, the government really opened via this several special economic zone um, policy, which allowed investment to come in in a controlled manner um, through the gateways of Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Um, Guangzhou is now deemed to be the, the center of China's fashion industry and has over 140,000 businesses actually located in Guangzhou. Um, so names like your Fendi's and your Chanel's and your Gomorshi, um are very present in this city. Then we're going to move on to actually um, how people do business in China. Um, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, there are many different types of ways to do um, business in China and very many different types of legal entities you can, you can form. Um, you can form equity joint ventures, contractual or cooperative joint ventures, foreign investment joint stock companies. Um, but really by far and most important is the, um, what we call the WUFI, the wholly foreign owned enterprise. This really has become the, the number one um, leading uh, way of investment into China. Um, it allows the foreign direct investor more control, um, and it, it, you may think that it actually leads you to have fewer connections with the local, um, within local China because of the fact that you um, actually have no foreign partner, but we really in our experience say that this control is really worth everything. Um, and it's very beneficial um, as a vehicle to enter into China. So really what we're going to focus on in this presentation is really the WUFI, because this really is the number one um, vehicle that, that foreign direct investment is actually using at the moment. Um, so the minimum capital requirements are really insignificant. Um, really this is all about process. Um, Chinese authorities really like control and bureaucracy. Um, there's always several layers to things, and you have to follow the process and the layers exactly. And we'll come on to how those, that rigidness of the system actually causes some issues when you're dealing with um, compliance of these entities. 
The whole process is really a three to four month process. It's very difficult to push this it's very difficult to hurry it. Um, what we found is where we have actually applied pressure on the local authorities to, to speed up the process, it's actually had a counteractive effect. It's actually slowed down the process. So when you make your plan to set up in China, if you're going to use a foreign-owned enterprise, please really work on a time frame that it's going to be a four-month process. Um, and you are going to have to be very patient. It's going to have to be one step at a time. So moving on to slide 11. Okay, this is um, really about the preparation. Um, before you even start the process, you really have to have a physical address. You have to have a, an original lease signed and a property ownership issue certificate. That is really key before you can even start the process. You have to have decided your Chinese name. You have to have decided your registered capital and the structure that that forms. And also you have to have picked your legal representative. Now that legal representative can either be a local person or a foreigner. There is no restriction in that. Then the next thing is you have to really think about the board of directors that you're going to have and the general manager. Again, these, these, um, these positions can be held by foreigners. Then what is really, really key, and we cannot emphasize this as too much actually in this whole process, is the definition of your business scope. This is really crucial because this business scope will be what actually appears on your business license. So you really have to actually sit down and give careful consideration to this to this business scope. It is really akin to the objects clause in a limited liability company. It's but you need to formulate it very carefully because everything that you do in China needs to be defined and in your business license. So this is very key. So it's very important that you get the key stakeholders, you very important you get the management together with the service provider and define the business scope. And then you need to think about a board of supervisors as well. Moving to slide 12, this is really considering an overview of how this process actually happens. Um, it looks complicated, and trust me, it is. I mean, as you can see, there are several layers of approvals. Um, and my um, our managers in China say it's a little bit like Angry Birds. You cannot progress to one level until you've done the next level. There's no way you can skip to the next level and go backwards. You have to go through the levels one by one. And this is very common in, in Chinese, uh, Chinese entities and their compliance. There is an order, there is a process, and you must follow that order and process. There's no ticking a box and then going back and then reticking another box. You need professional support throughout this. You need a good service provider, somebody who really understands the local requirements, and also good legal support. Um, there are many different levels of approval, as you can see. Um, the minimum number of licenses per WUFI is about five. Um, most commonly, there is six to eight in any kind of WUFI. But as you can see, it's um, quite complex, and it takes a. that's why that time frame of three to four months is, is really really accurate to how long this actually takes. And you need a good service provider to really be able to pinpoint where you are in the process because none of this is online. It's all through government authorities, through local people. So you have to figure out exactly where your paperwork is and have those connections and the local knowledge to actually get that procedure done. Moving on to slide 13. Um, this is really about what we see in China. Um, it really is complex there. You really have to look around a whole situation to ensure that you're getting all the information you need. Um, TMF, with our offices spreading across China, we can really provide insight and some local practical tips to help you in the day-to-day -day, um, management of, the, of, your, of your entities. Um, tax clearance, for example, is, is, can be quite complex. And if you relocate um, your company from one district to another, um, it can be it can be a, a, a massively complex um, situation to deal with. Which um, sometimes you can really get in the it's stuck in the middle, and it becomes really impossible to actually 
um, use your entity while you're doing that. Um, finding the right people in China, um, there's been a lot of press conference uh, coverage about um, the the fight for labor in the market. Um, it has become notoriously hard to attract and keep talent. Um, we actually um, provide a solution to that, and we do this with a lot of clients where we would actually outsource particular functionality into TMF so that we provide your back office support so that you're not having to deal with this massive turnover of staff or where some of the stories are that you actually, when you sign the contract of employment, you're actually agreeing to a 10% pay increase each year for the next five years. Um, things like this are now becoming quite commonplace. So um, outsourcing is definitely something that is on the up in, in China and it gives you stability. Um, the last point, expanding in China is like entering a different country every time. Um, it is one country. Um, the national laws do apply throughout municipalities and provinces, but the local ambiguities and the local interpretations of this legislation exist. So it's really key to understand um, the nuances between the different cities, municipalities and provinces. Um, for example, um, you set up a Shanghai Wufi and a Wuhan Wufi. Uh, you would think that they would be the same, but really there's different rules and there's different considerations. Um, relationship and communication is very key to all of these processes um, because really, as I said, there's, there's no real automation here. It's, it really is um, a manual process that you have to follow. So if you've got somebody on the ground who understands the process and can communicate clearly with the authorities, then you have this, this ability to keep track of, of what you're doing, uh, which is very key. Um, so it's very easy to lose track of where you are in a particular process. So it's very key to have a good service provider, a good lawyer standing by the side of you, and really a good um, central repository of information um, like the GEM system. That's, that's really key every single time to figure out exactly where you are in the process. So we move to slide 14. Um, this is, um, this is a, a very valuable slide, actually. Um, we base this on, this is local knowledge. So this is um, actually the differences between three, four major cities in China. Um, it's, quite, uh, it, it's easy to read, and I'll let you have a look at that later. But it's quite shocking how basic things um, between Shanghai, Beijing, Chengzhou, and Shenzhen differ. And this is really an, an, uh, an illustration of how, although it's the same legal system, these different interpretations and local nuances really are key um, to getting it right. And if you get it wrong, um, you can be subject to deadlines um, and you can be subject to penalties. Um, as I said, each WUFI is really probably has five to eight licenses. Um, we had one client with over 100 entities um, all over China, um, WUFIs, representative offices, branches, equity, joint ventures. And then they used local law firms in each of the different cities and provinces they were in. And although there was an excellent service there, there was no you know, binding thing that held it all together. And so this company really lost track of their entities and lost track of the compliance status. And as they were actually a listed co in Europe, this was really a significant issue um, for them. So um, TMF got involved. We put in a GEMS database. We really looked at the, um, all of the records, we, we gathered up all of their different entities. And I mean, it is really quite surprising. Um, people do lose track of their entities and it's, you know, you, you feel that you set up another, another operation in a different city or a different um, municipality and you have to set up another branch of another WUFI or another WUFI. So it's very easy, although it sounds crazy, but it's very easy to lose track of, of, of what you actually had. So this central repository of information is, is really key to doing business in China. Um, so what we did was we got all the information, we input it into the GEM system, and we could keep track of the entities and branches and deadlines and help with the overall compliance so that the uh, listed co could really um, look at their whole um, operation in China and the group legal director and the company secretary could sleep soundly at night. Um, deep pocket listed you know, international companies um, do attract penalties in China. Um, it is just a fact of life. So you have to be very careful to avoid missing any deadlines um, and incurring any penalties. 
Um, so having this gem system or a central repository for information is really key so you can manage those license payments, renewal dates, and deadlines. Okay, slide 15. This is just really an overview of compliance between um, a rep office and a WUFI, JV. Um, so really, um, this is very basic, this is basic compliance and it compares and contrasts. But really, what's key to this is good, pre good preparation, um, really organized, good professional support, um, and really understanding what you're doing and where you are in the process. That's great. That, that, that's uh, a lot of great information right there, Suzanne. Thank you. And I think uh, for those on the line, that previous slide, that pinkish kind of slide that, that we had up there, um, I think she downplayed the value of that slide. <laughs> I think it's a uh, a really tremendous slide with a lot of great information. Uh, we will, at the end, uh, send these slides out to anyone that is looking for them. So we have, we have all the contact details at the end. We, we can uh, send an email out and we'll, we'll send out that, that materials to you. Like I said, that that, uh, that previous slide is worth the, the price of admission in and of itself right there. So um, <laughs> that's really great. I think it's a great opportunity right here as well to to uh, to introduce Elizabeth to maybe try to put a little uh, take take an opportunity for her to to give some insight into her experiences and best practices and challenges that she's seen sort of in the real world, um, you know, from the from the client side of, of things. Elizabeth, you have absolutely some examples absolutely. you could share with us. <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, one, thank you very much for um, having me involved in this. And, and that pink slide in and of itself, I think, speaks to um, the reason why some of us don't sleep at night. Um, because it does. It's, it's such a varied region, and it's a little scary when... Um, you know, this is something, this is an area that we are developing continually, and it's it's gotten the attention of our um, top management, and we are expanding in the region, and, and this does cause me uh, a bit of sleepless nights because, you know, as Suzanne said, it's it's very different in, in different regions, and trying to keep track of your entities and the numerous filings and scoping out the business properly and maintaining kind of the oversight at the at the at the time while it's in process is a moving target so to have um to have the continuity of one um, service provider that is helping you in multiple regions and to have one database where you can keep track of everything at one time and that your entire team has the opportunity to see that at any given time is is key for us it just it just is the only way we can go we're coming out of a you know a glorified spreadsheet system so Clearly, you can see how, with all these moving parts and with all these different filings and and um, requirements, how you can lose track of things very, very easily without something that's comprehensive and available to everybody. So um, that's one of the reasons why we have the gem system in place, and we utilize um, TMF so that we have the continuity between the two um, or the multiple regions out there, but the two interact very well together as well because we have TMF working in our system, so we're constantly aware when they update things. Um, just one of the things that, that um, kind of the background of what brought me um, in this region to look for solutions and alternatives is um, we had heard about a, an event that had happened with a large corporation with a, a branch in, I don't even know which region it was in um, in China, but apparently they had closed the branch. However, they had failed to follow all the rules and, and regulations of deregistering, 
And because that process wasn't followed properly, the person that was the representative officer actually was penalized by not being allowed to um, run a, another company for two years following that, which just terrified me and, and really drove home you know, the point to to me and my team that we have got to keep this really on target. I, I question our tax department, our our attorneys here, anytime they say we need to open up another business entity in China. Okay, do we need it? Are we absolutely certain? Any way we can get around doing it with using a current entity? Okay, no? Okay, great. Now, Let's look into what are our options, what just makes the best sense, and then really trying to back them up in the time frame. As Suzanne said, give yourself plenty of time. And and for us, I understand that usually we we get notified at the end of everybody's thought this through. They want to open up an entity in China. Okay, go. Can we have it next month? and trying to back them out and, and try and help them and be able to have a, a database and a contact that we can go to and say, okay, now here's where we are in the process. We still have two months to go. Keeping everybody informed, key element, makes us look good and helps us sleep at night. So between the two, we we just couldn't work in the region without them. Great. Thank you for for that story and for, you know, maybe keeping the rest of us up at night now. Um, but <laughs> but with, with, with all that, with all those regulations and concerns and challenges, you know, what we want to do now is just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how you would create that program. And, and Suzanne and Elizabeth both kind of shared some examples or some uh, some components of the of the challenges. But with all of those regulations and all those processes, it really is critical to have a comprehensive governance and compliance system. Uh, and so what we'll do is walk through a bit of uh, a few uh, scenarios or a few ideas of how we would help you set up a uh, set up the process. Now, again, with TMF and ComputerShare together, we each have a, a service. There are a lot of services out there that um, that do this. You know, we we think we've we work together to kind of create a, a workflow that really kind of combines both of our strengths to provide a really strong solution to uh, to companies like Thermo Fisher and others that uh, that, are, that are using it. So, why don't we go through some, some of the some of the highlight areas, some of the the compliance and risk uh, areas that uh, we really went through a lot of these, or Suzanne really kind of went through a lot of these. Uh, and talking about the details in China. And what we want to do is look at now how would you take them and automate them in a process through a system, through a, through a database uh, like GEMS and, and using uh, a firm like TMF to help administer it. So it really is sort of the two, the two programs combined. So we'll talk about you know, creating a workflow for forming uh, entities, um, you know, having the, the local knowledge in the database. So you know, looking at it as a, as a as a global solution, China right now is one of the uh, one of the hottest topics, and, and certainly you know India and Brazil, which are which are our next two sessions are on, um, are two other ones. But having one centralized solution where not it's not just all of your your China information, but it's all your global information and how it all ties in together uh, is really is really key. And so having that local knowledge, as Suzanne said, uh, you can take that information, put it into the database, so you can have, you know, you can have your jurisdictional rules by country, by city within country, so then you're now uh, managing to that, uh, to that process. We'll, uh, we'll go through a few of these other pieces as well. So as you're, let's start with just forming the data. Uh, you know, do you have that local Knowledge. Do you have that local council, somebody like TMF, uh, that's able to provide you all that key uh, process and procedure information that then feeds into your feeds into your site? So if you're, you know, when you're forming that WUFI, do you know all that all those steps? That slide that Suzanne brought up, that you know, the Angry Birds slide that you have to go from step A all the way to you know step Z. How how does that 
how does that work? You can automate that most of that process with a system like GEMS uh, and really kind of go through a uh, you know a step by step procedure. So let's look at, let's look at the the workflow. So if you're going if you're going to enter information in, so you have now all of your all of your entities, all your woofies and all your other entities set up uh, in a system like GEMS, you can now have an auditable workflow of how that information is being tracked. So we have an example here with Adam being the GEMS updater. Now Adam could be, uh, and in this scenario, would be somebody at TMF potentially that is creating the information for you um, or you've requested to form a new entity entity. You've, you've, you've identified that you need to kick off the process to, to form a WUFI. Uh, that, that a new entity request form would be submitted through the, through the database and processed with the rules uh, either through the system with the local knowledge or through a, you know, uh, your provider like a TNF with your local knowledge. So then now you have that audible process. And each step along the way is managed in the database. So you can always go back and have the auditable trail, which is one of the really key things in the whole entity management space is having an auditable process so that there is that, that audit trail you can go back and prove the steps that you took, that you did go A, B, C, D, and you didn't skip two steps in the middle type of thing. You have the proof through, a, uh, through an audited, audited system that's stamped along the way. Right? And then once the information is in your database, so having going through all the steps to create it the first time and, and filling out the form the way with all the data that, uh, that Suzanne had sort of brought up there for you, once that's already in there, then on a regular basis, you need to verify it. You need to make sure that it's, uh, it's being attested to, that, it, that it's accurate. Because that's, you know, that's oftentimes where we've seen companies uh, where the process breaks. Everyone focuses all their energy on making sure you set it up right the first time. But then there's a lot of activities that go on through the life cycle of that entity. And you need to be looking at as it's going, you know, are there annual returns, are there filings, are there accounts, what information has to be processed on a regular basis, and what individuals have come in or come out of that entity uh, along that time and, and, and in the various different jurisdictions, there's different information that needs to be processed when an individual is appointed or resigns from an entity or the entity uh, is moving from one state or, or city to another. So there's, there's, there's a whole verification process that can be kicked off. And again, the process is a combination of the internal company resource combined with somebody at TMF or in, in a process like that where that individual is verifying that information for you. So TMF does a great process that they call their health check that through the, through the life cycle of the entity, they will go out and verify that, yes, all the information that you are storing on your GEMS database is what the government regulatory body has in the various countries is accurate. So you can have that verification process. And again, there's an auditable stamp. There's not an auditable process that gets tracked in the system. So as you kind of go back through on a quarterly basis or on an annual basis, you can verify that, yes, the information that we're using for these, for these filings and these returns has been verified by somebody locally or at a service provider like TMF. And then it's how do you report that information up? How do you, how do you take a 50,000 foot look at your information, right? Then you can go granularly, like I said, through the audit trail to look at your information. Then you also want to be able to sort of pull back and look across all your regions or look across all your entities in a particular region and understand how compliant are they with the rules that you've put in the database or the laws that you've set are in. Uh, in that local country or the bylaws that that company is set up under or the filing processes that that company is uh, being regulated by. So you can have really nice, quick, visual compliance dashboards that you can look at to identify, we set out a program in the beginning, are we on track, where are our risk areas that we need to focus in on. 
you know, we sort of kind of touched on these uh, this sort of workflow, if you will, along the way. But to me, it's really those that um, those arrows that kind of come up the right hand side, which is having that that governance program, managing your risk, and, and providing transparency in the process. And that's really one of the big things that uh, has really resonated with a lot of companies. And the more and more regulation that comes out, the more transparency that you have. And you know, you know, sort of the example that Elizabeth gave, and some of the other ones that 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 we've heard, some of the horror stories, if you will, that, that we've heard throughout the years is most of the problems happen when there's not transparency. When the you know the the chartered secretary of the COSEC that's in London or New York or wherever they are doesn't have visibility into what's actually going on in in country, so in China or in India, that they don't know that individuals are being appointed or that companies are being formed or that there's laws that are changing. There's not transparency back to the parent company. And and having the auditable system will help you detect those risks and will help you have visibility into what's going on on the ground in your various countries. And that's to me really the, the benefit of sort of having a combined solution with sort of the GEMS and TMF, but having that transparency into the process is really is really key. Okay. Because then it's not so we focus a lot of times on just the, the legal need of the infrastructure, but that information the you know is utilized by many different departments around the company, which just leads to the the importance of having approved and verified data in your entity management system. So there's the, the really important piece of making sure that you, know, you don't fall into the trap of what you know Elizabeth, the example that she gave, and, and having your director not being able to, your business head not being able to do business because um, certain filings didn't happen correctly or certain processes weren't formed correctly. Um, but then also you're sharing that data you know, in, in, a, in a, a perfect solution. You're sharing that data with your tax department, with your auditors, with your banking groups. Um, it's not just the legal infrastructure, it's all of the other components that kind of drive off that org chart of the entities uh, that you are now able to, you're able to leverage because you have confidence. You have transparency into, uh, into your process and you have confidence that your information is correct so then you can share it with the other groups so that now that the company um, is taking advantage of the process from, uh, from other departments as opposed to just the legal COSEC side. And to kind of elaborate maybe a little bit further on that annual examination of the legal structures, I think uh, Suzanne had one, wanted to talk a bit more about uh, the examination of the Wolfies. Suzanne, I'll pass it back over to you for, for this one. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I mean, everything you said is really key, um, having all the information, everything into a central repository is, is really key to actually going through this annual examination um, process, which is really a supervision and management system, um, which whereby the relevant government authorities carry out the inspection on the company registration. Um, they literally do this once a year. The period goes from March the 1st to June the 30th of each calendar year. So we're in that process right now with uh, um, the WUFIs, um that we have. And there's a number of um, authorities that really are involved in this process. I mean, there's the Commission of Commerce, the Statistics Bureau, the Finance Bureau, the Tax Bureau, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, and the Administration of uh, Industry and Commerce. So this is really quite a complex, um, process and you have to get it right. Um, so there is a potential to do an extension of 30 days if you have a justifiable reason, but you have to do that application and, and the reason has to be really quite strong to have any kind of delay. So this um, annual examination or AE is, is really key. Um, 
Really, it um, shows that you need to be in control and all of your license deadlines. You need to understand who your directors are, where they are. You really have to have full control of your company, which is why the GEM system really helps you get a get your arms around exactly what you have in China and where it is. And what sort of what is its state of health? What you know, does it have a cold? Does it have a temperature? You know, or is it perfectly healthy? Um, so it's very very key to have this um, information and data into the GEM system, and this helps you get through this process. Um, any issues you have um, in the annual examination is obviously multiplied by the number of woofies that you have. So if you have one director who is, um, hasn't had their details updated and they are a director of all of your woofies, then you, you have a big problem. Um, and it's not easy to correct that in a very short period of time. As Elizabeth said, you have to have real patience in China. You have to follow the process, you have to follow it exactly step by step, and you have to be able to breathe and have a little patience. Um, China is welcoming of foreign direct investment. We, we don't want to make it painted as being a difficult place to do business, but really, you know, China wants people to be successful um, and it wants to, um, foreign people to employ its people, but really you must comply with their rules. Um, everything must really go in the process and everybody must put their stamp of approval or their shop of approval on it before it moves to the next authority to actually go through the vetting. Um, if you do not comply, um, as you can see from the diagram, um, the first thing is after the 30th of June you get a fine which can range from 10 to 100,000 RMB um, and then it goes through different stages. Um, so you get an actual announcement by the Administration of Industry and Commerce um, if you still fail after 60 days, your business license can be revoked. Um, it can then go to a higher level of fine. And then the final and uh, most drastic um, situation is that they could literally nullify and revoke your, um, your woofie. So uh, this really is uh, quite serious and it's really important that you get it right. Um, it's good to have um, good people on your side. It's good to have good service providers who understand exactly what they're doing. We do this all the time. We're prepared for the auditor. We're prepared for all the different authorities um, to come in and help you tick those boxes um, quickly. Uh, once you've been through the process a couple of times, it becomes um, easier, but uh, the first time is a little scary. Um, so it's very important that you um, have all of your all of your compliance in order. Back to you, Tom. Okay, I think that's a good that's a good note to sort of leave everybody with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of kind of a cliffhanger there. The uh, and and so that but it does tie into you know doing business in these other countries. So we do have you know a few more sessions kind of geared towards New York and uh, London uh, lunch times. So we have. Uh, India and Brazil coming up in May and in June. So certainly you can go to the website and register for those uh, those sessions as well. And as I as I promised in the beginning, you, here's our contact details. If you want uh, certainly if you want copies of these slides, you can drop me a note, uh, and I will be happy to send off a, uh, a copy of these slides so you can get uh, all the great information that uh, that Suzanne had put out there for you. And Reach out to any of us with any any questions. We have a few questions that came in through the uh, through the chat window here. We have uh, oh, just a couple minutes as we come up on the sort of the full hour here um, that we we can we can address. If we don't get through all the questions, we'll respond back to you uh, certainly directly with, with with any answers. But uh, we'll start. Actually, I'll take I'll take maybe the first question here was that um, can Gems help create an org chart for their Asia Pacific? Entities and absolutely. So you know, I, I talked a lot about the the workflows and the processes uh, of getting the information in. But one of the real key things about Gems is is then being able to take the information that you have and report on it. So in one of the key reports is the org chart structures. So uh, you can you can create org charts for just your Asia Pacific group. You can create charts for your global. You can you make them. We have companies that will make them sort of wall size because they're going to come into a big sort of tax planning kind of meeting uh, and look at them that way. Or you can put them into books so they're more sort of a, 
multi-page PDF type of book where you could uh, and you can email it out to individuals if you need that kind of a structure. Uh, there's a lot of formatting and, and things that you can do with the charts to kind of fit them to your needs because that's one of the things that we've learned over the years is that everybody kind of has a slightly different reason for creating a chart, whether it's to, to fold it into a, a regulatory filing, uh, a Fed Reserve filing, a um, you know, like a tax planning kind of meeting that you're going to have. So there's lots of different reasons why people will create the different charts. And, you know, the, the, the charts that a tax group is going to create might be slightly different from one that a, uh, a legal group is going to change, uh, create. So you can even filter through them for sort of uh, tax, tax uh, structures versus legal structures and things like that. So there's a lot you can do with, with from a charting perspective and get you more information if, uh, if that didn't give you all the details you're looking for. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the questions that came in is, can China woofies have branches? So I guess Suzanne, that, that one's probably really more a question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it really depends on um, where you want to set up the next piece of business. Um, obviously, as Elizabeth said, it's it's good to um, actually avoid setting up more entities or more branches than you actually need. So. Uh, what we tend to do is sit down with a particular corporate client and look at what they have and see if something can be used um, or to see if there really is a, a brand new requirement for a new branch or a new, new woofy. Um, very much depends on the particular city or province that you're looking at. Um, so what we do is we really help you figure out is another entity or is another branch actually necessary um, because as you can see, uh, you really need to try and minimize them if you possibly can. Okay. And really another uh, this is sort of a, a question maybe for all of us, and it's certainly uh, it's certainly a doozy. Is you know, any do you have any suggestions on how to deal with corruption? Um, sort of come in the questions kind of come in a couple different ways, but but I know certainly uh, corruption in China is a is a major concern for U.S. and and, and British companies. Right, so um, maybe I don't know. Do either uh, Liz, or Suzanne, you want to take a maybe first pass at yeah, that? What your suggestions I'll, are there? I'll take the first uh, crack at this. Um, as you will have read, I mean, when when President Obama was re-elected, um, we actually had a change of leadership in in China, um, the first one in ten years, and Premier Li has come into power, and he's quite an interesting character. I mean, we're still seeing a lot of information being unveiled about him and he's very actively at the moment traveling the world and meeting different prime ministers. I believe he's just been to see the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um, but really in his um, opening speech he really vowed to tackle corruption and bureaucracy. Um, so corruption is a hot topic. Um, the Chinese um, government are really aware that it does happen and they really are taking a tough stance on it. So I think um, him coming in as a leader is, is really the next step in the process to try and stamping out corruption. Um, TMF as, as a firm, obviously we, we have to comply with the Foreign Corruption Practices Act. Um, we do not get involved in any kind of facilitating payments whatsoever. Uh, we, we walk away from it and we strongly advise that our clients walk away from it too. Um, really the strong line is the only way to go. Um, I'm sure many people have read the headlines about different multinationals getting involved in corruption. It really isn't the answer. And it really, if you do take the strong line and you do walk away from it, I really feel it's the, it shouldn't affect the success of the business in the long term. So uh, that, would be, that would be our take on, on that. Yeah, my advice, know thy provider. Um, I mean, that's that's the best the, the the best and the only thing I can say. And if anybody offers to help you speed up the process, run, run, run. Um, it's a it's a process that takes time. There's no quick way around it. Um, you need to do it right. If if you bypass things, it will come back to bite you, and it will bite bite you big. Um, and the PR that comes from any even perceived impropriety is is not something that any multinational can really um, withstand. Know your process, have have um, transparency, as Tom said, and know your provider. 
Right. And you'll do fine. And, and my last maybe sort of parting thought on that is, you know, as having dealt with that sort of on the U.S. side, you know, going 10 years back now and the whole Sarbanes-Oxley and the fallout of everything that that had was it really, it really came down to creating that sort of auditable, transparent process. And I'm kind of a broken record, but, but that's really the more that you can do that, the more that you can have the insights into your process and be able to prove what you did, that's really how everyone sort of came out on the other end you know, after a lot of uh, thinking and planning and stressing on, on Sarbanes-Oxy, is really the companies that, that put together a really strong uh, auditable process were really the ones that, that were able to prove success. So I think the same sort of holds true for, for kind of going into China and some of these other countries uh, in today's market. So I think we can learn from, from what we did 10 years ago. Um, so with that, I think that kind of concludes our, uh, concludes our session. really want to thank... Suzanne and Elizabeth for for sharing all of their uh, their their wisdom with us uh, this afternoon, and uh, we You're look welcome. forward to we look forward to seeing or hearing from you all at uh, at one of these upcoming sessions uh, on India or Brazil as well. So please go out and uh, look for those on the on our website. If you have any questions beyond here, certainly our emails are here. For all three of us, reach out to any of us. We're more than happy to answer any questions, provide whatever information uh, that we can. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.